But when you wake up from that dream, you will understand crystal clear with zero doubt. You will understand everything those scientists and philosophers were trying to say, because you will see that that which is surely 100% physical from one view of reality becomes absolutely 100% mental when you wake up to another view of reality. The Three Minds framework essentially says that the universe is consciousness. Hello, Anoop. A warm welcome to the show. Thank you, Yannicka. Good to see you. I'm really grateful to have you on the show today. I know you have a powerful NDE story, and you're also a body-mind strategist, an emergency, emergency room uh, physician, and an author. And I'm curious, actually, about how your spiritual experiences have influenced your life as a medical doctor. And we'll get into that, and I'd love to hear your near-death experience and what unfolded after that. But before we go into this, what were your spiritual beliefs before you had this mystical experience? Great. So for me, my childhood was a lot about experimentation. And it was about playing with my reality, playing with my mind, playing with the world, and seeing if I could bend it and play with it and what would happen. My parents were very much into Indian philosophy, a philosophy called Advaita, which is gaining popularity these days under the name of non-duality. Basically that there is an underlying unity that is expressing through, you know, this, this, uh, this diversity and multiplicity of this world that we see. So, I listened to many people talk about this and describe some of their experiences, and it seemed like there was something true in that, right? I can't say that I believed it completely in the sense that it wasn't my own truth. I believe that there was some truth in it, but what exactly was the nature of that truth? You know, what did it feel like? What did it look like? You know, what did it smell like? If there was a smell like that, I didn't know. So it wasn't a belief in that kind of sense, but it was this curiosity to, to kind of shake this hypothesis, you know, and, and take it apart and put it back together and see what would happen. So I did a lot, did a lot of things with that in my mind. Like I would sometimes look at things for a long time, or I would try to see things from different perspectives. Um, I dabbled in meditation. So those were kind of my exploratory practices. And of course I happened to be around a lot of people who had dedicated their lives to this, even when I was in elementary school and middle school. And so they, in a sense, carried themselves, we might say differently. They moved in the world a little differently. Uh, and I found that intriguing and something to explore. So those were my foundation, the preparatory foundation that kind of led me, or at least were before changes that happened in my actual experience. All right. And then I know that you had this mystical experience or near-death experience actually before or in the midst of studying to become a doctor. And I'm curious, first, uh, firstly, uh, did you actually die or was it more a mystical experience that you had? Yeah, that's a good question. I've been told many things about it. I never really called it anything for many years, maybe more than 10 years or so. Uh, and then I happened to get in touch with I think it's the president of IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Experience or Near-Death Studies. And she said, technically, this is classified as a NDLE, a near-death-like experience, because the physical body, it, the death of the physical body is not what precipitated the event. Usually there's a threat to the physical body and that precipitates the event. So that's called an NDE, but it's near-death-like experience or NDLE when there is no threat to the physical body. Now, I will tell you there was a, a threat, quote unquote, threat to the physical body. Uh, but that came later during the experience, as opposed to that is what precipitated the experience. Some other people I've heard call it STE, spiritually transformative experience. Some people say mystical experience. So, you know, there's so many terms for this. So take us through what happened. How uh, come you have this mystical yeah. experience? Yeah. I'll just add one more comment is that not only was I not clinically dead, I would say I was like, some one of the healthiest times of my life. Um, you know, it, it was towards the end of medical school or the latter couple years of medical school. And I was pretty fit. I was, you know, everything looked great. <laughs> and 
In fact, uh, I thought later that if I had gone through with this completely, the body would have died surely and the body would have been there. And I, I, people would have been like, oh, medical student committed suicide or medical student did drugs or, you know, there would have been some story to make, to try to make sense of a fact that a, a perfectly healthy young man, you know, that the body was just found there dead. So uh, to, to get to the actual story, um, it was when I was back from medical school on a break, maybe for a weekend or something like that. And I was in my bedroom, my parents' home, right? The, the room that I had grown up in for so many years. And I was reading something. And when I was, as I was reading this, when something, something in the book caught my focus and I was, I was focusing on it, I was reflecting on it. And all of a sudden, it was like an explosion went off. And everything in the room disappeared. The body disappeared and, you know, the thoughts disappeared. Everything essentially disappeared. And the experience was one of sitting in a blaze, right? Almost like sitting in the essence of fire. Sitting, I often say it's like sitting in the sun. It's the only way that sounds true is to say that it was like sitting in the sun. And not just sitting in the sun, but actually being the sun. So it's not like... I was here and the sun was there, but it was just being the sun. And so what does that feel like? It feels like absolute radiance. It feels like, um, it's kind of like a color of a blaze, like an orangish saffron kind of blaze. Um, it, it's not hot, oddly enough. It's, it's, there's not, it's not hot or burning. It is, it is the essence of, pleasantness. Um, and you can just say that there's, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing to be had in that sense. And it was this timeless experience. And at some point as this went on, it was, it was as if this was actually a gateway. So then the sense of identity is now progressing through that gateway. This is what it feels like. Right. So here I am as the sun, so to speak. And then there's a movement like beyond that. And then at that moment, there was a being, a being that was also of the same nature, let's say made of the sun, for lack of a better phrase, that put an idea before me. And the idea was this it was that uh, this wouldn't be fair. And the hint that there is still stuff to do, or there's still work to do. And it wouldn't be fair to go prematurely. I'm of course putting it into words, but it was something like that. That was the sense that was imparted to me. And there was some sense of the truth of that. I think I recognized that there was truth in that. And because of the recognition of that truth, I paused. I paused in moving beyond the threshold. It was clear that if I had gone one more, I was right at the ledge, so to speak. It was clear that if I had taken another proverbial step, that there was no coming back. It was done. And in a sense, everything in me was moving in that direction, everything. And there was a recognition, a nonverbal recognition that any angst I had ever experienced in my lifetime so far, or anything that I had wanted to practice or figure out, or the restlessness that I felt was all about this. It was actually about seeing this, knowing this, recognizing this, remembering this, being this. And so that was, we can say, the force that was carrying me through this. Uh, but when this being put this forward, then it was just so true that, you know, you can't ignore it. And so I paused and that pause, that, that, that abating of that momentum and that force carrying me just pausing just a little bit. That's all it took because there indeed was a great force that was actually keeping me on the planet, so to speak with the body. There was a tremendous force there, but the force 
bigger than that. And that's why I was being carried forward. But when I paused, you know, it's like a rubber band that is stretched to the maximum. It really wants to pull you back. But if there's a force stronger than it, you can go and snap the rubber band and you can keep going. However, if you pause even a little bit, the rubber band, boink, it will spring back. And that's exactly what happened. The truth gave me pause. And that pause is all it took. Everything re-imploded. Like, like everything came back. And the room appeared to be reconstructed. The body appeared to be reconstructed. There was a reassociation with, uh, you know, some kind of mental structure and the physical structure. And at that point, everything looked different, felt different, was different, or at least seen more deeply. And that's the first part of it. Very fascinating. Um, I'm curious, uh, do, do you think that your spiritual beliefs from before uh, influenced this experienced some experience somehow? No, I don't, I don't think so because this can be described with any number of words. It can be described with God or without God. It can be described with philosophy or without philosophy, spirituality or not spirituality. And, and they're all kind of true. It really doesn't matter the words that we use. I think it was actually the other way around, which is that it, it was more the desire to know what I am, the desire to know where I've come from, the desire to know what this world is, that led me to have the experiences in my life so that I could arrive at some kind of language, which is where the three minds framework came from. And also wanting to communicate this, right? So if I didn't have all that preparation, even if this has happened, I wouldn't really know where to start in terms of trying to translate this in medical science, in philosophy, in, in the popular world with regard to AI and UAPs and UFOs and everything, right? So I was very lucky to have some kind of narrative that I had heard and to be able to pick and choose from that to so that I can talk about it now in the way that I do. Right, that makes sense. Uh, so you were reading a book, uh, maybe you said it, but I don't remember it. You were reading a book, and uh, was it sort of an answer to what you were reading? and? Uh, sort of were, was figuring out in a way you could say that it was a it was a philosophical text um so it but then you know it, it, in a sense it was kind of an answer to everything <laughs> not, not really that book you know like i said it, like every angst that i had every question that i had every doubt that i had about anything it might have been something i thought was about a math question in fourth grade who knows right but it was actually about this that was very clear. And so um, the answer is yes, but that yes needs a lot more context to understand it. It's not like I had a particular question and this answered it, but the philosophical book kind of brought my interest to a peak and I focused in on something and that was like the match that lit the bonfire. It's so fascinating that that, that happened, uh, that that's possible. Uh, okay, so is there a second part of this uh, experience, or did you go back or, or and experience more? Yeah, I mean, I guess there are so many ways to talk about it. I mean, there was the 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 few moments immediately after. Then there were a lot of unfoldings over time, and actually openings in which I recognized things from my childhood that had happened, but I had forgotten about them. You know, and then. Um, and then, you know, other kinds of experiences that come later. And then there's the whole integration of it, which I talk about a lot because I think that's a really important aspect today. Um, you know, now there, there are psychedelic experiences, there are spiritual experiences, there are mythical experiences, near death. Um, people, are, people are hungry to see what being human is really about. And there's so much more than the standard narrative, you know. So there, there are, yeah, there's more to it. And there's going back to that. So, for example, I can say that experience continues now. That's why often when I talk about it, depending on how I talk about it, I have to slow down a lot. And there end up being a lot more pauses, you know, because uh, it's a place without language, for example. You know, and I can say that although in story form, you can say that there was a beginning and end to that experience. I would say that that experience has never ended. It's still happening right now. and that all the colors and perceptions and forms and sounds 
and spaces and times and realities and conversations that we are constructing uh, are happening within this greater field uh, that is beyond space and time, in which what we call space and time structures itself. So in that sense, it's, it, it hasn't really stopped either. So yes, there are many different components to this. Uh, how did this change your relations to other people? Because you said something about when I came back, sort of a lot of things uh, were changed and I saw things differently. And I assume that you maybe behave differently with other people that are close to you and not so close and colleagues and students, et cetera. So yeah. how did that change that part of your life? Within a short period, within a year or two of that, so I think I was towards the end of medical school. And then within a year or two of that, I started my training in residency. And I also got married, like at the same time, pretty much. And residency training, you know, you're almost always in the hospital. And you're hardly sleeping well, and you're usually not eating well. And so it's almost like that covers up for any like, strange or unusual behavior, because it's like, everybody's kind of sleepy, or you're groggy, or there's always you know, there there are 100 reasons you can give. So I think because of that, some of my, I don't know, bewilderment, and some of my um, lack of ability to socialize properly, I think that was kind of covered up, you know, it's like, well, you know, he's not sleeping well, he's not eating, he's always working and things like that. So that that's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting thing to note. On one hand, it kind of gave me cover when there were so many changes then happening over years in my life so much powerful and deep integration, like raking the soul almost that were happening. Um, but on the other hand, it also made it a lot more difficult because I was training in emergency medicine. So I'm seeing gunshot wounds and stab wounds and heart attacks and life-threatening infections. And I'm seeing babies in distress. I'm seeing really old people. So, you know, all of a sudden you're open and you're seeing and recognizing things um, from your own history, your own lives, your own, uh, you're seeing space and time differently, and you're seeing these people who are in extremis, and you're not sleeping well. And so it was just a ton of stimulus, you know, an overwhelming amount of stimulus that really took a lot of work to, you know, realize and develop an ethic that, that taught me or that works for me to manage my life. Um, I wonder sometimes so people who have these experiences where they are encompassed in love and feel so unconditional loved. And I, I think, you know, one of our main diseases in humanity is that we feel we are not enough and that we're never good enough and not lovable. And when we all of a sudden have this feeling that we're lovable, to me, I'm thinking, well, doesn't that make the whole difference? Like, yeah. aren't you completely changed? Like, all the others of us, we are working with ourselves through personal development and meditation and all these things. Yeah. And you guys who have these experiences, you sort of just get this gift of, oh, this is the truth of who I am, right? Yeah. But it still seems like there's a lot to work with afterwards that you're not completely transformed and healed. Uh, or did you feel that actually a lot of the things you've struggled with, because we all struggle with things, uh, were instantly healed after this experience? I th not everything. Some things, yes. You know, especially the part about wanting to know. You know, that wanting to know itself is a kind of wound. You know, it's a kind of non-remembering of what is true and what is complete and whole. And so much of my life was connected with that. You know, it, since, I was a, since I was a kid, I always wanted to know, like, is this true? Like when somebody said something, you know, especially when somebody said something about mind or world, I say, is this true? I know this person saying this. I know I respect this person, but I don't know that it's true for myself, you know? So let me like read something else or let me play with my mind or let me do this or do that. So there's this constant experimentation going on. And here it was like the fruits of the experiment, you know? So you saw, you experienced, you were, um, so that, that in sense was healed and that has never gone that has never even flinched but there are so many aspects of the personal life that still have to be lived and that have been lived in lifetimes and what happens is that door opens 
and everything starts parading in, you know, the things that we keep out so that we can live our day to day life cannot be kept out anymore. I suppose if a person really wanted to, they could try, but it would be extremely taxing on the system to try to close that door because that free flow of energy is just so much more natural, you know? And so, um, once that door opens, then everything kind of comes right into, and it's like, that has to be worked on and that has to be worked on and that, and it, it keeps happening, you know? And so, uh, yes and no, some things are healed and some things keep on healing. And the, the other aspect of that is there's no such person. There's no such thing as a person who is healed period, who is completely healed because we are all connected. As long as there's any being anywhere who is suffering, there's no individual who's completely healed. It doesn't matter how spiritual they are, quote unquote, you know, how godly they are, quote unquote, or whatever. It doesn't matter. We are like, you know, the, the external appearances of one organism. And as long as there's someone somewhere, frankly, anywhere in the cosmos, it's not just earth. As long as there's anything where there's not a balance, that imbalance will be felt in every single person if they're sensitive enough to notice it. Yeah, it makes sense. And I also were thinking about my own experience because I've had some mystical experiences that gave me the proof that I am love and I am loved and I'm still struggling with self-love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it makes so much sense what you said that yeah. there's always something to heal and we're yeah. one. That's yes. like a core principle. Yeah. I'm curious about how this influenced your work as a doctor today, knowing these things. Uh, and also, if you've had some resistance from colleagues, like, is this something you uh, talk about at work? Yeah, I, I just want to make one more point about what we said before, um, is that like, you know, when there's a struggle with self love or with anything, it's also important, as you just said, to say that it's not always our struggle. It can be some, it can be the struggle of someone that we are connected with, or it can be the struggle of somebody in the bus that just went by. You know, and and if if one is sensitive enough, we can pick that up and we can help to heal that or we can say, you know what, that's not mine. But having that recognition is really important. And that gets into your current question about the ER, you know, because the ER is like an epicenter of pain. The ER is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Right. That means when a person has a problem that they cannot solve and when everybody else tells them no because it's Christmas day and it's 7 p.m., right? Or it's New Year's day and it's midnight or whatever. Take, take the most popular holiday in your country and the most popular time when everybody is with their loved one or everything is closed. Guess what? There are tons of people who don't have anyone and you know where they go? They come to the ER. They often come to the ER because they want to be seen and they want to be healed. And even on a regular day, right? So yesterday's, um, yesterday was a Monday, even on a regular day, people come in for all kinds of reasons. Inevitably, the idea is that the biomedical view can heal you, right? Because that's why they come to emergency medicine and allopathy in general. The idea is the biomedical view of my experience can help me heal, or at least somebody can just see me as a human being. But that's not always true. Many times the problems are not primarily physical or biomedical. They may be psychological, emotional. They may be energetic, right? They may be from other lifetimes. They may be existential. They often are existential. But when you come to the ER, it, it's kind of, we take everybody. We don't say no. We say yes to everyone. And so what happens is any kind of pain that gets bad enough and can't be solved, doesn't matter what kind of pain it is, arrives in the ER, right? So one has to be very careful. That's, that's something that I didn't realize when it initially happened but I was taking on so many things from so many people uh, and not just, not just the patients, but even colleagues, you know, when there's that much pain, one has to be really aware of, you know, who am I as a person, right? Wh wh where's the boundary that defines this person and defines the other person? Because it's not physical. If you zoom in on your skin, it looks like a line, but there's no line there. It's just bumpy cells. And if you zoom in on the cells, there's no line of the cell, it's molecules. And if you zoom in on the molecules, there's no line, it's atoms. And it keeps going until you get to the smallest particles, which are vibrations in non-local fields. 
So any boundary that we perceive in the physical world, including the boundary of my head, including the boundary of your screen that you're looking at, it's simply a perceptual superimposition. It's a limitation of the human nervous system. It's not that the boundary independently exists. It exists only in relationship with our nervous system. And so the idea that you are there and I am here is actually, it's a perceptual superimposition. It's not a fundamental reality or a truth. And that's why you can feel what I'm saying, despite, you know, we're hundreds or thousands of miles apart because we're not disconnected through time and space. So that becomes a very interesting and tremendously powerful question. Where do I end and you begin in a doctor patient relationship, in a friendship, you know, in a romantic relationship, in any kind of relationship. So that's something that I had to look at and I had to work on a lot to see how I influence people. Um, and so to answer your question of how it changes your practice, for me, it's really about how I enter the room and how I am in the room, right? Because my practice is still biomedical, right? The, the model I use is the allopathic model. It's just that it's no longer everything I see. That model is, is a fragment. It's a frame within what I see. So I still think and operate through that lens, but I also know there's a lot more than thinking that happens in an encounter. It's more about your presence in the room. It's more about who you are and how you are rather than what you say, which comes from who you are and what you are. So that's, that's the first part of the question. The second, in terms of colleagues, I would say that most don't fully understand um, what I'm saying or doing. You know, many know that I've written a couple books. Some of them have read a book or two. You know, uh, many people consider me the quote unquote wellness guy or the spiritual guy or something like that. But what that actually means, I'm not too fond of all of the labels. What I really like to do is explore with people what this actually means and what are we talking about? Because I think it's supremely practical and relevant in our moment to moment experience. So, uh, and I've, I've written a lot of articles in emergency medicine uh, newsletters, you know, I've printed in the Journal of Wellness, uh, I've given talks, I've done meditations at the hospital. Uh, usually it's seen as, okay, you know, that's spiritual, that's meditation, that's wellness. Uh, there are few people who actually dive into the depth of what I'm talking about, uh, because that would change or at least challenge some of the fundamental concepts we have in healthcare and biomedical science. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I think that's part of the problem uh, that uh, people don't want to look into it or certain kind of professions because that really threatens their belief systems and changing their belief systems and everything that is a threat we don't want. And it's a huge thing to change your belief system um, because it is what we know, you know, it is what we uh how we understand reality and life. And I assume that's why it is so challenging for those who've had mystical experiences like that to come back to life. And often I see, I, I mean, people leave their spouses and their lives completely change, changes. Now, I know that you sort of, I don't know, discovered or creating sort of a teaching out of this that's called the Three Minds Framework. Yes. Would you mind going through uh, what that is? Sure. So after this experience and integrating this experience, which is still happening, not that it's complete, but as, as this has continued, I found that I needed a language to talk about this, right? And I didn't, the, the language that I had heard growing up or the different kinds of language I'd heard didn't feel, didn't satisfy me, right? It didn't feel like it's exactly what I wanted to say. So what I did is just speak about it and speak about it in terms of how I saw it and what I experienced. And that is this, it is namely saying that what we see as the world, including the physical world, you know, the earth, the solar system, the galaxy is not fundamentally a physical thing, but it is a form of consciousness, right? And the best example is the dream that when you have a dream while you are in the dream, you know that everything in that dream is physical, right? You can stub your toe on a brick and the toe will bruise and it will bleed, right? You can, you can hammer a nail and hit the hammer on your nail and you'll have a lot of pain, right? You can uh, be nestled in bed and feel like the soft, warm comforter that keeps you feeling very nice on your skin. And you know, all of these are physical. And in that dream, if you conduct an experiment, 
and you call a bunch of philosophers to the table and you call a bunch of scientists to the table and we we try to discuss what all of this is most people are going to say yes this is physical world and then there are thoughts and that is the mental world and these connect this way and that and there'll be all kinds of opinions and they will all be 100% right that's important to understand from that view of reality but when you wake up from that dream you will understand crystal clear with zero doubt you will understand everything those scientists and philosophers were trying to say because you will see that that which is surely 100% physical from one view of reality becomes absolutely 100% mental when you wake up to another view of reality and the three minds framework essentially says that the universe is consciousness and that consciousness is fundamental and that which we call mind our individual minds and that that which we call the physical world and physical reality is simply we can say crystallizing versions and forms of conscious processes exactly as it happens in a dream i'm not saying this is a dream per se i'm simply saying that the mechanisms at play are the same as that of a dream so that's the foundation so what are the three minds then the three minds are three different views of this reality right so it starts uncompromisingly it it doesn't end at what i said it starts with what i said it starts by saying the world is consciousness the universe is consciousness the cosmos is consciousness now here's why it looks differently to different perspectives the first mind view of the three minds the first mind is essentially the experience that what i am is a local individual in other words the sense of consciousness the sense of being conscious the, the sense of who i am and what i am is local it's here in a particular place it's with a body it's in the chest or it's in the head or it's close to the body basically it's localized in a particular place and what the three minds framework says is that if this experience is there if a being experiences themselves as being localized in a place in a distinct location then what they will see is a world of distinct things okay so i want to make that clear if i feel that i have a boundary around me and this boundary defines me whether it's the boundary of my personal body whether it's the boundary of my personal mind meaning my personality my likes my dislikes and so forth if i can define some kind of boundary that defines me anoop what i am who i am then because of that i will refract a world of boundaries and i will see a world of multiplicity and things around me like i will see a camera in front of me a laptop in front of me a tree in front of me i will see a cloud i will see individual particles and so on infinite multiplicity why because the boundary that i take myself to be is reflected in this infinite consciousness it's reflected and it appears as this world it's like light goes into a prism and you see its many colors refracted out right in exactly the same way when identity is taken to be bounded it refracts through this prism of identity and we see this space-time world of multiplicity that's the first mind view that is the standard view in our earth culture and that is a standard view from which most of science operates right and quantum science is starting to question that which is why they talk about the the relationship between the observer and the observed and where that line is from where we can divide the observer and the observed these are all questions that quantum science calls into view and it is questioning in fact whether the world is a local thing or not this is the first mind view the second mind view is the experience that what i am fundamentally is non-local it is not that i whatever this thing is that we call i it is not that i is a localized thing or is in a particular place no in fact what this i fundamentally is is not in space and time but it is the nature of this i it is the expression of this i that becomes that vast mind that is the topography of space and time this is the second mind view in the second mind view the local worlds are still accessible and visible right so the personality the body the characters still engage in the world and still are a part of the world however the awareness the vision the knowledge the identity is not rooted 
in that world, right? It sprouts in that world. It expresses through that world, but it's not rooted in that world. And so the second mind view is the view of the non-local or the view of infinity through which the finite experiences, including worlds, are experienced. This is the second mind view. The third mind view then is simply that of undifferentiated consciousness, or we can say pure potential as potential. So it is the essential nature of all prior to its rustling, prior to its, its heaving as the universe is, the worlds, the world of space and time. So what we have here is one and the same consciousness seen at three different levels in accordance with the kind of identity that is crystallizing. And the first wine mu, we simply say, well, I'm here, you're there, here's a world, you know, there are only limited resources. We have to figure out where to get that from so we can make this work. And basically the entire boundary, the entire context in which this world exists is totally not seen, just as it happens in a dream often. When we're in the dream, where we have the resources of that dream, but we don't see that the dream is being created by unlimited resource. Anything can show up in that dream, right? Anything can show up in that dream, but in the dream, we don't know that. We believe that the dream is a closed system. And that is that first mind view that is propagated throughout education and culture today. That is a very helpful framework, uh, beautifully put, and uh, it makes so much sense. So. Uh, if you had a magic wand and you could help all of humanity, uh, how could you help them sort of move into the second mind view of seeing so much more of who we are? Yeah, well, I feel like I do have a magic wand and I feel like you have a magic wand and we all have magic wands and, and we're doing it, you know, like, so uh, talking about this and being able to tell a story about this is so gratifying to me. It's so, and it feels like, like, what more can I do? You know, I, I feel so much gratitude that I can tell this story of what the world is and what the universe is and just make it a story that's available to everyone. So everybody's like, whoa, that would be crazy if that were the case, you know? And, and you know what? It doesn't violate anything that you're taught. I, I didn't, I don't ask anybody to believe anything. I don't, I don't, I just say anything that you've learned in the world can fit here. It just says that that's not all that's happening, right? And you actually get more power and vision and ability and capacity by saying, okay, I accept that, but there is a more here. That means it's directly related to who I am and what I am and how I see myself, you know? So to me, this is the magic wand. Many people are talking about that we're in the shift of consciousness. Is that also your experience that we're part of this ascension process and we're coming to the end of this ascension process? Uh, we're definitely in the midst of a transition. You can see it in current events. You can see it in, uh, in stories like this. We're hearing more and more. Um, so yes, and whether, whether where we are in that process depends on this moment and how we, how we receive what's happening in this moment, how we engage what's happening in this moment, how we interpret how we play with it, how we experiment with it, because there's no fixed timeline per se. Time, the time itself is not a linear fixed thing as every single human being experiences that, that time is not a linear fixing. We learn to associate our timelines with others. And so we create a narrative, we create a public narrative, but public narrative is not where life happens. Life happens in your experience mm -hmm. and public narrative is a part of our experience. So, there's no time per se. It, it is based on our experience and our vision that produces the timeline. What I find a bit uh, interesting with your experience, if I may, uh, how I listened to it was that not that much happened in a way. Yeah. It, it was more like inside of you that it seemed like you gained all this knowledge. But usually when I interview people about these experiences, so much happens. It's like, then this happened, then that happened. Then mm -hmm. even though it's not a timeline yeah. there, yeah. they have different memories. But it seems like you sort of got answers to so much, like listening yeah. to you speaking right now, yeah. compared to what you actually said you experienced. Yeah. Uh, 
yeah do you want to comment on that sure so this goes back to what i was saying that you know that everybody is intelligent not just everybody's intelligent everybody's intelligence right everybody not everybody is a genius everybody is genius everybody is of the nature of genius and so when i talk about consciousness being fundamental this consciousness is it is of the very nature of intelligence so simply by associating as consciousness like infinite amounts of knowledge can be received it, it's it's not it's not verbal knowledge it's not conceptual knowledge it's not one thing and then another thing and then another thing and another thing simply with association everything is received everything that has to be known everything that needs to be known is received and it's unstoppable it is wow. unstoppable like nobody and no thing no culture no education can stop the receipt of this and nothing can cloud the veil again all right nothing can cloud the veil again i think that's good news and i i think we that needs to happen because what we're moving towards is a lot of change when it comes to artificial intelligence and also i think we will have more contact uh from other uh star systems what are your thoughts on what's coming to earth and our development mm. now when it comes to artificial intelligence i know there's multiple questions there well let's take artificial intelligence first what are your thoughts okay. on that yeah i think artificial intelligence is going to keep developing i think i think ai is uh and and the the burgeoning of ai and the the prolific speed with which it's advancing is our desperation to know ourselves right it we know that everything we can do we should not do just because i can do something doesn't mean i should do something but if i am so in the dark about who i am and what i am and if i know i have so much potential and i just want to feel it, i just want to do it i cannot help myself and that's what's happening with ai right we as a culture know it's you cannot stop that awareness that there is something tremendous within us like look what we can do right look what we can create um, and so we cannot stop ourselves why because we haven't done the exploration to actually see and experience that part if we see and experience that part of ourselves we will not need to develop ai so much because ai comes from ni ni is natural intelligence and everybody's forgotten about it we're all we're all like very happy about ai but we never talk about ni ni is you and me ni is what this world is made of that gives rise to ai ai is actually a subset of ni and we don't realize that we think ai is something new and different no it's actually a very limited subset of our own natural intelligence and it's highly decontextualized because we don't know how we are producing it we don't know the subconscious desires that are producing it and and what aspects of ourselves we're putting into that and so it's going to do some great things however we have defined great and it's going to cause a lot of problems because we don't know what we are doing we don't know how we are creating what we are creating so ai is going to take on a, a bigger and bigger role and we're going to see some big salt big problems being solved and we're going to see some new problems big problems being created um, and the only solution to that is to know ourselves better and to appreciate our own native natural intelligence um there's also a huge thing happening with UAPs now as you know UAP is unidentified aerial phenomena it's the new term for UFOs it's yeah. it's okay to say UAP but you can't say UFO apparently you know it's it's the, it, it's made it okay um but you know these uh, these kind of phenomena have been going on for you know probably centuries certainly centuries certainly millennia factually in fact um but in the last 100 years we've always uh said we debunk those things or those people are not real or they're making up things you know and of course now in the US the department of defense is talking about it their congressional hearings about it and more things are coming out about it and they will continue to come out and yes i think while a lot of the contact has been you know hidden a lot in the past i think more and more it's going to come to the forefront and i think there's going to be a tremendous amount of confusion in society exactly the same as ai we're talking about another kind of intelligence that we won't have the capacity to gauge because it will be so far ahead 
in so many ways from like earth human intelligence that we will not know to assess like what is true, what is not true, what is helpful, what is not helpful. And there's going to be confusion on that part. Fortunately, the solution is the same. It's to get to know ourselves and to get to know our own intelligence and develop that intuitive intelligence to know what is true, what is not true. Right. And how powerful we are. I feel like humans are disempowering themselves all the time. And that's yeah. coming forward in my interviews. How powerful we are is coming through channelings as well. You are powerful beings. And it's something about stepping into that power, not giving it away and going to the external all the time. Yes. Now, do you have three recommendations for people listening uh, that you would, uh, or advices on how they could live, you know, a more balanced spiritual life? Like what would be your main three messages? So, you know, when I went through, and I'm still going through a period of integration, after some some changes that kind of rocked my foundation that forced me to kind of live what i had suspected for a while um this is a very practical kind of thing there there are four i'd say areas of life that i recognize that help people integrate and that's nutrition movement connection and rest and this is quite elaborate you can find it on the health revolution website there's an article on this but um what I found is that integrating these four areas are key to keeping that balance, right? Because it's all about balancing worlds, balancing worldviews, balancing identities, and not falling too much to one side. Because if you're too much to one side, you can't operate in the world. And if you're too much on the other side, you have a very false or constricted idea of what the world is and what is possible. So how do you keep that in balance? Nutrition, movement, connection, and rest. Nutrition, and all of these apply across mind and body. Nutrition, number one, the biggest thing is to cut out processed foods, right? Because in a way, this stuff isn't food. It's not what the human system is designed to run on, right? So just very simply eliminating processed foods. And the other one is eating um, fresh whole foods, plenty of fresh fruits and vegetables. And I can give many more recommendations after that. But honestly, those are the two biggest. We don't have to talk, like get into, is it keto? Is it vegan? Is it this? Is it that? Eliminate processed foods and then eat plenty of fresh whole foods, especially fresh fruits and vegetables. All right, that's nutrition of the body. Nutrition of the mind is this. It's listening to other narratives about what the heck is going on in this world and what this world is. There is so much hypnosis, right, in the forms of thought that you see just because it's in the textbooks or somebody with a PhD or an MD says it, you know, what they're offering is their worldview. It's not about true or false. They're giving you a worldview. Is that the worldview that gives you the life you want to live? Is that the worldview that shows you all of what you are? Or is that a worldview that is, is like a, a heavy backpack on you that you have to carry around and make it true somehow, right? So opening yourself up to powerful narratives that feel true to you. And not, not just believing them outright, but saying, whoa, that is a tremendous hypothesis. Let me start playing with this in my life and see, right? And listening to such stories, because everything we tell is a story. That's nutrition of the mind. So nutrition of the body, nutrition of the mind. Now we get to movement. Movement, number one, uh, these are all number one. But anyway, movement, one of the first ones is moving the body, all right? So Everybody knows that as exercise. Great, if you can exercise, fantastic. But not everybody's going to be ex going to be exercising. I don't know why we always talk about exercise because some people are just not going to do it. So what can you do? Range of motion is awesome. Every single joint, what I say is if you have a joint, use it and move it, right? Even, even this tiny joint, what we call the DIP, the, distal, inter, the distal interphalangeal joint, right? Move it just because you can. And then this one, every single one, the jaw, the hips, the toes, everything. Because from the three minds perspective, even the physical structure is representational. It's mental representation. So if you move the body, it will move the mind and you will, you will, so to speak, see around the corner, right? You won't be just in this kind of linear fixed joint, but you, the more you move that joint, the more you will kind of metaphorically and, and visually see around the corner. So moving the body, right? What else? Moving the breath. This is tremendous. This is what connects the physical structure and the energies of the body. If somebody's breathing 
deep and slow, you will see that their mind is calm. If somebody's breathing rapid and shallow, you will see that their mind is anxious. It's one of the simplest ways to calm down or to calm somebody else down in the ER if they have anxiety is to be aware of your breath, breathe slow and deep and enter the room. And what you will have is two energies meeting in the room and whoever is more anchored in their presence, the other person will move towards that person in terms of the mental state. So if one person is more grounded than the other person is anxious, the anxious mind will move towards the grounded mind. If the anxious person's anxiety is so great, then the other person's mind will start to get anxious too. This is why there's a lot of burnout in emergency medicine and why emergency medicine is difficult because so many people are in different kinds of pain that anxiety is a chronic state there. So one has to always be aware of our mental state. Are we moving towards that or is that moving towards us? Right? So this is movement of the breath. Then there is movement of our emotions. I can't tell you how important this is. You know, I have so many people on our Healing is Possible podcast that have healed from so many diseases by moving their emotions. And that's, I'll just plug that in shortly here, which is that everything I'm talking about is about integration in terms of opening up, seeing the world more fully. But if you're just talking about healing a disease, it's the exact same things, right? Because that is the beauty and the power and the depth of the human being and of what works. What works, in a sense, works across the board, right? So getting back to movement, movement of emotions, that means the things that we felt decades ago have to be moved. They have to move through us. They cannot be allowed to stagnate and physicalize, right? This is true for other lifetimes too, not just this lifetime. But if we start with this lifetime, the doors to everything else will open. Right? Some people try to force things through certain practices and it can lead to um, delaying healing. It can lead to more injury because of the trying to force. Instead, start with what we're aware of right in front of us. If we deal with everything that we're aware of in front of us, the mind will open to the next level of awareness. There's no need to force anything, but we have to deal with everything that's in front of us first. So moving the emotions, releasing that, it changes the physical structure too. And finally, movement of our creativity, right? What do you love to do? What do you have to say? It doesn't matter if nobody listens. I tell people, sometimes I come into my basement and I start talking, right? I'll start giving talks. And sometimes I do it quietly when, when, if I'm, there are other people around, but I feel like saying, and I'll just, I'll start a narrative, right? Because I love communicating, right? So what do you love doing? Even if there were nobody around, right? Maybe write it down, maybe draw it, right? Maybe sing it, Maybe say it, maybe talk to somebody, it doesn't matter. But what you have to say, what you think, feel, want matters. And you must express it in some way on some scale. It doesn't require money. On some scale, you must express that. Because that, that, that validates your power, right? That validates who you are. And so it releases and brings more resources into you. So movement of the body, exercise, range of motion, movement of the breath, movement of our emotions, movement of our creativity. Nutrition, movement, now we come to connection. Connection is threefold. One is, of course, connecting with others. And this is often ignored in spirituality. And I had to set this aside for a long time as I went through many processes myself. But connecting with others is important because it's important to know yourself as others and not just to know myself as a noob or just to know myself as consciousness. But to know myself as others is equally important because it it fills out the experience. So that's connecting with others, connecting with oneself. Who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? What is my relationship with this world? What is this world? Essentially, these are all the same question. In English, in concepts, verbally, it sounds like different questions, but it's really just one question. It's wanting to know what this is and what's going on, right? So the point is not about getting to an answer. The point is about validating the importance of the question. It's like, wait a second, I have some questions and this is important and I want to know, right? Simply put that within yourself and then you'll start moving. Things will start to happen. So valuing that, and that can be through words or reading, through mindfulness practice, through meditation, through many ways, but valuing those deep questions, valuing that connection with oneself, connecting with others with oneself, and then possibly the greatest biohack in the world is connecting with the planet. All right. 
and that's directly contacting the planet. So that's feet, bare feet in the soil, bare feet in the ocean, bare feet in the creek. That is fresh air in the lungs. That is sunlight on the skin. And that is your eyes on the sky, right? When you do that, you're fully plugged in. It doesn't matter if you don't understand it. If you don't feel it, doesn't matter. Just keep doing it. And that intelligence will start to seep in and your doors will start to open. So that's connection. And the final one is rest. Um, simple one is sleep. Everybody knows about sleep. Sleep is important. Yes, preparing for sleep. However, there's something even more important than sleep, and that's rest in itself. Because sleep is a kind of rest. Rest is not a kind of sleep. So rest is what is truly needed, right? So learning that even while I'm awake, even while the mind is functioning, even while the body is speaking, how can I be in a restful state? And then that restful state carries into sleep and it carries into the waking state. So nutrition, movement, connection, and rest. You asked me for three things, that all is number one, but I know I've taken up a lot of time, so I'll just pause it there. And that's that's actually what the what the course is about, Yannicka, that I told you about, is about activating these yeah. engines. Yeah, I just got to say thank you. I just see the time is running uh, by us and I wish we had much more time. Uh, but tell us a little bit. Thank you so much. This was true wisdom to me. Uh, tell us a little bit about this program that you're having and everybody uh, who are listening can receive 25% off uh, yes. on this program. And the link is somewhere here. <laughs> yes, yes. it's it's. Um, I think it's healthrevolution.org slash true dash north. Uh, True North, I believe that's the, otherwise I'm sure you'll post it. Um, literally, it came through my own experience of having to integrate so much and trying to figure out how do I stay balanced in the way I want to be balanced in this world, not in the way that the world tells me I need to be balanced or whatever, you know, what balance means to me. And so through trial and error and making a lot of mistakes, I arrived at these four engines, nutrition, movement, connection, and rest. And at some point I said, I want to say this, you know, I want to talk about this and I want to talk about this so much more than just healing a disease, by the way, all kinds of diseases heal with this. Yes. But in terms of integrating the personality, in terms of opening the windows and doors, all that is what this is about. So we created a course with four modules, nutrition, movement, connection, and rest that you can take, you can take it all at once or over a month, but basically each day there it's a 28 day program or it's a 20 day program with two days rest in between. And each day you get a lesson about nutrition and then a practice what you can do. And it covers all of this. It covers the food, it covers the nutritional stories. It covers movement of the body, the emotions, the breath, the creativity. It covers connection with the planet, connection with ourselves, connection with others and resting asleep and resting while awake. And I truly believe that we, each person has that power and that healing capacity and that vision and that nature and intelligence within them. And I would like everybody in the world to see this, you know, and to practice this and to try this, because even if you do one or two of these consistently, they all lead to the same place. They all open up the same doors. So that's the course that we offer. And it's an honor to bring it to you. And I'd love to hear from you, your experience at the course. Yeah, I'm excited for people to experience it too. And uh, even though we're over time, I have three questions that I ask all my guests. So I'd love sure. for you to answer and hear your perspective on what is self-love to you? Self-love to me is being yourself and having the courage to be yourself. If a person does not love themselves, they cannot be themselves. You know, because especially in this world, because there's so many shoulds one should be like this, one should look like this, one should dress like this, one should talk like this, one should believe like this, and so on. And it takes self-love to say, well, actually, what I feel, think, believe, know, see, etc., is okay with me. And it's, it's not that I reject other people's view, but I have space for my view, and I have space to consider others' view. And what is happiness to you? I'm going to give the same answer to all your questions. <laughs> Happiness is the effect of being oneself. So when a person is themselves, there is a natural peace. There is a natural radiance. And there's a natural joy or happiness. And happiness is kind of like 
the titillating external aspect of all that. But the root of that is being oneself. And what is the deeper meaning of life from your perspective? <laughs> On a personal level, the deeper meaning of life is to be yourself. The purpose of life is to be yourself. And everything unfolds from that. The deeper meaning of life as it is, I don't think meaning is always personal. Meaning is always relative to an identity. So I give it as being yourself in terms of life as it is as something else. To me, it just is as it is. This was true wisdom to me. Uh, Anup, thank you so much for being here today and sharing really in-depth teachings and your worldview that was really inspiring and also a lot of helpful tips to what we can do. Uh, I just found myself being elevated <laughs> right now. I feel like it resonated in my body and it was really nice uh, to feel. And also it just, yeah, really resonated everything you were saying today. So thank you so much for sharing your message and for coming to the show. Thank you, Janneke. It was a pleasure to be with you.